Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathering tonight on the lands of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, my name is Douglas Gilfoyle. I am the Associate Dean uh, Research at the Monash University Faculty of Law. And my job this evening is to introduce the, I think the correct word is the eponym for tonight's yep. named lecture. I think uh, he looks <laughs> <laughs> uh, Very distinguished people usually start to roll their eyes at me if I read out anything approximating their full CV, so I'll be as brief as I possibly can. Uh, the Reverend Tim Costello is one of Australia's best known community leaders and is a sought after voice on social justice issues, leadership and ethics. For 13 years until October 2016, Tim was Chief Executive of World Vision Australia, placing the challenges of global poverty on the national agenda. In his current role as Chief Advocate, Tim continues to use his public profile to effect change. In addition, Tim is Chair of the Community Council of Australia and is a member of many other uh, <coughs> bodies serving the community interest. He's a founding board member and spokesperson for the Alliance for Gambling Reform, which campaigns for law reform to prevent harm from poker machine gambling and has been active in that cause this afternoon. Uh, in earlier roles, Tim was national president of the Baptist Union of Australia and mayor of St Kilda. Uh, he has been Baptist minister at St Kilda Baptist and Collins Street Baptist in Melbourne, as well as executive director of Urban Seed. In these roles, he spearheaded public debate on problem gambling, urban poverty, homelessness, reconciliation and substance abuse. Initially, Tim studied law and education at Monash University, followed by theology at the International Baptist Seminary in Switzerland. He also received a master's degree in theology from the Melbourne College of Divinity. In 2006, Tim was named Victoria's Australian of the Year. In June 2005, he was made an officer of the Order of Australia. In 2004, he was named Victorian of the Year, and going back as far as 1997, he was named as one of Australia's 100 National Living Treasures. His numerous books include Faith, 2016, Hope, 2012, and We Await Charity in Due Course. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to the Reverend Tim Costello. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. With my wife here, I've got to tell you that there is another book uh, called Love uh, Around Charity. After hope and faith, though, my wife, who's here tonight, said, hmm, not sure you know enough about love. <laughs> so it's ground a little bit to a halt, but hopefully it'll, it'll come out. Uh, a delight to um, have my uh, good friend uh, Tim McCormack uh, giving this lecture. He's here with his wife, Karen, and their son, Jacob, and uh, we want to thank both of you. I, I did ask his wife, would she like to introduce Tim and uh, an unfiltered version? Tim quickly said no, so I'm doing the job. But um, Tim uh, uh, has been promising for some time he would come and do the Costello Lecture. It's been running, I think, over 15 years, but uh, the sticking point was always that he was a professor at Melbourne University. Then we found a loophole. He uh, had been at Monash uh, for four years, 1984 to 89, so thankfully that loophole sees you here. Um, you'll see from uh, his bio that um, he's Professor of Law at Melbourne Law School, Adjunct Professor of Law at the University of Tasmania, Special Advisor on War Crimes to the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Uh, I'm just back overnight from uh, the refugee camps in Bangladesh where nearly a million Rohingya have fled. I have seen some of the worst places on earth including refugee camps outside Mosul this year and South Sudan and uh, Ethiopia. This was by far the worst and these are people who are stateless. Uh, now they're homeless, their homes have been burnt, women raped, many many killed, a million have fled. Sadly, the International Criminal Court doesn't have jurisdiction over what Rex Tillerson has called ethnic cleansing, as did the Queen of Jordan, Queen Rania. We're in the same camp, in the same place at the same time uh, two days ago. But um, this work of International Criminal Court, even with uh, certain exemptions from countries that haven't signed up, is incredibly important work in our world. 
Tim's also a director of World Vision Australia, and he chairs our People, Remuneration and Culture Committee. It's a great delight to have you here today, Tim, and would you welcome him to give this lecture? Thanks very much, Tim. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a real honour to be asked to deliver this lecture tonight. I, uh, I was making the comment to Professor Guilfoyle earlier that I know of no other lecture named in honour of a person who's still alive. It's much more common, I think, to although still not all that common, but more common to have a lecture named in honour of the memory of a person. But to actually uh, have someone still alive and to have a lecture named to honour that person is quite a remarkable thing. Surely uh, Monash Law School forgot about the football team that this bloke barracks for because there's no way that they would have done such a thing if they'd known he was supporting a bunch of drug-taking cheats from Essendon, <laughs> would they? But, uh, well, I can't talk about uh, my own failings. The fact is it is a great honour for Tim to have this lecture named to honour him. It says a great deal about... Uh, Monash Law School's valuing of him as an alumnus of the, of the institution. And I believe that I'm the first person to share his name to deliver the lecture. It wasn't mandatory because 13 or 14 others before me certainly did not share this, uh, this name. So I'm delighted to be the first team. But I'm also really pleased because, as he suggested, we're, we're very good, good friends and we've work together a lot uh, in the cause of World Vision Australia and World Vision International and I'm really privileged to be able to co-labour with him on a topic like um, the Rohingya and their forced expulsion from Myanmar. It's of great sadness and frustration to me that the ICC, the International Criminal Court, does not have jurisdiction. It should have. These crimes are appalling both in scale as well as in character. So what I'd like to try and do tonight is reflect on the International Criminal Court as an institution as the statute that establishes it, the Rome Statute, um, marks its 15th anniversary, or did actually, on the 1st of July 2017, 15 years since entry into force of the treaty. And I'd like to <clears throat> suggest that the International Criminal Court is in a very difficult situation in terms of the mandate that's been given to it and that whatever decisions are made, particularly by the prosecutor, because the prosecutor is the, uh, the officer of the court with the most significant prerogative to initiate proceedings, whatever decision she makes is uh, thoroughly contentious. And I'd like to try and explain a little bit about that uh, and then end up with a conclusion that perhaps won't be as bleak as the content might suggest. So let me just start with a few basic facts about this ICC, which is different to the International Cricket Council, of course. Um, it gives me great pleasure that we don't have to spell out the acronym anymore because it's uh, probably taken preeminence over the cricket body. But some basic facts about the ICC. This is the world's first permanent international criminal court. It's based in The Hague which I thought until a few weeks ago, the age uh, Saturday uh, Good Weekend Quiz is, was the capital of, of the Netherlands. It's not, the constitution says Amsterdam is. I actually had a big argument about that and was proved to be wrong. So I suck it up, but, uh, <laughs> but what the Dutch government has done very successfully is convinced the entire international community that The Hague is the international legal capital of the world. And that city hosts the International Court of Justice the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the Iran-US Claims Tribunal, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, and Europol, and the International Criminal Court. And it was a very unusual experience in Rome in 1998 when the diplomatic conference was held to negotiate the terms of the statute to have the Dutch nominating the Netherlands, uh, sorry, the, other, the Dutch nominating The Hague as the host city of the court unopposed. That's something that never happens in multilateral affairs as it doesn't in hosting of Olympics or 
uh, FIFA World Cups or whatever else it might be. The Dutch have done a magnificent job of convincing the world that that's the truth. There are 124 states parties, so 124 countries that have signed up to the Rome Statute, just shy of two thirds of the international community. I think we need 128 or 129 to cross the 66.67% uh, threshold. The court has 18 judges who are elected from amongst the state's parties to the Rome Statute, all appointed for nine year terms. And as I said, the court was set up by multilateral treaty, the Rome Statute. Australia played a very significant role in the negotiation of the, uh, of the statute. We uh, chaired the so-called group of like-minded states, a group of countries that was really committed to an effective, robust international criminal court. And Australia has continued to play a very strong role in support of the court as we come into this year's annual Assembly of States parties in New York City in the middle of December. Australia will chair uh, the complementarity um, particular discussions at that annual meeting. So let me make a few observations about the ICC in the context of the historical development of international criminal law. In one sense, the ICC is a natural progression of what's gone before. We think about uh, International Criminal Justice 1.0 at Nuremberg and Tokyo in the aftermath of World War II, and, and also actually not just those two major trials of senior, uh, in the case of, of Nuremberg, senior political, military and economic figures, and in the case of Tokyo, senior pol politicians and military personnel. There were in fact thousands, literally thousands, of subsidiary trials conducted at the national level. Australia was part of that process. We conducted 300 war crimes trials of more than 820 mainly Japanese defendants in eight different locations, uh, only one of them on the mainland of Australia in Darwin, uh, only three trials there, but the others in Papua New Guinea, in Borneo, in Singapore, in Hong Kong. There was a big wave of, uh, of, 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 of trials against uh, major war criminals from the two defeated Axis powers of World War II. But we've always lived with the criticism of Victor's justice, that this was the winning side of the war, imposing a process of justice on the losing side. And there's, there's been a taint to the legacy of Nuremberg and Tokyo because of that, that problem with an approach to justice. We had a little bit of a hiatus, 45 years in fact, before International Criminal Justice 2.0 came with the UN Security Council decision in 1993 to establish the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And the following year in 94, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. This is a move away from the winners of the war imposing justice on the losers, but still some problems associated with the establishment of tribunals ad hoc for specific conflicts. If it's good enough for the Balkans, if it's good enough for Rwanda, why not also for Burundi or Zaire or the Central African Republic or East Timor or Guatemala or Honduras or El Salvador, the list goes on in other parts of the world. Since those two ad hoc tribunals were established in the 1990s, we've seen a sort of a International Criminal Justice 2.1, if you like, a, a move away from the creation by UN Security Council resolution of ad hoc tribunals, the establishment of a group of what are some call, sometimes called hybrid or internationalised tribunals where governments have worked together with the UN uh, in varying degrees of uh, cooperation to establish national tribunals. So we have in Cambodia, in, in Phnom Penh, for example, the um, extraordinary criminal chambers in the courts of Cambodia to try former leaders of the Khmer Rouge, a, a court or a tribunal set up by the Cambodian government and the United Nations, or the sp uh, special court for Sierra Leone in Freetown in Sierra Leone, again, a, a cooperative arrangement between the government of Sierra Leone and the UN. The ICC represents a sort of step further in the evolution of international criminal law away from tribunals set up ad hoc, whether by Security Council or by the government in cooperation with the international community, this time a permanent international criminal court. 
this time not limited to a single conflict, but at least potentially with jurisdiction anywhere in the world. This time created by a multilateral treaty. This time with complementary jurisdiction, not compulsory jurisdiction. So all those tribunals that predate the ICC have compulsory jurisdiction. What we understand in our own courts as the freedom not to say I'm not going to rock up to court if I'm the subject of criminal charges. The ICC is a little bit different to that and depends upon uh, the court determining that it is a court of last resort where relevant states, uh, and I'll come to some of the details of that, are unwilling or unable to deal with the trials themselves. The court is controlled by its assembly of states parties uh, and it also has an obligation to them in relation to the way that it operates, to the receipt of its budget, to uh, the support that it needs to be able to take individuals into custody and actually have them transferred to The Hague so that they can be tried. The US had a major objection in Rome in 1998 when the Rome Statute was negotiated about the fact that this treaty represented a threat to national sovereignty and here I think we see that the ICC perhaps isn't just a natural progression of the evolutionary process that's gone on through different earlier versions or manifestations of international criminal justice. Here it's, it's right to also point out the fact that the ICC represents something different. This time we are talking about a threat to national sovereignty that hasn't occurred before. So for example, the US had a major objection in the aftermath of Rome to the effect that this court has the potential to try nationals of non-states parties, nationals of those countries which have exercised their sovereign prerogative to choose not to become parties to the statute, not to subject themselves to the jurisdiction of the court. And yet the court, under the terms of the statute, still has the jurisdiction in some limited circumstances to try the nationals of non-states parties. I remember coming back from Rome being very dismissive of that objection because we have in international criminal law a concept of universal jurisdiction already. We have treaties that states are parties to that enable, or not just that enable, that oblige those states to criminalise violations of the treaties under their own domestic criminal law on the basis of universal jurisdiction. That is, irrespective of where in the world the alleged crime occurred, irrespective of the nationality of the perpetrator of the alleged crime, and irrespective of the nationality of the victims of that alleged crime. So Augusto Pinochet, for example, when he arrived in London and was arrested by the Metropolitan Pol Police, was arrested on the basis of the authority that the UK had, or that the Metropolitan Police had, under the United Kingdom's implementation of its obligations in the Torture Convention. That is to prosecute anybody allegedly responsible for torture irrespective of where in the world it happened. Now, I, I just said, well, that's all that the Rome Statute's doing. It's sort of taking that concept of universal jurisdiction and applying it more broadly. That's an okay argument to make up to a certain point. But the fact is I now am less dismissive of the US objection because when the UN Security Council referred the situation in Darfur, Sudan, for example, to the ICC, and, uh, and Sudan is not a state party to the Rome Statute. The prosecutor received authorization from, from the pretrial chamber to issue an arrest warrant against the incumbent president of Sudan. You can't say that's analogous to an exercise of universal jurisdiction because one of the key limitations on universal jurisdiction is sovereign immunity. And there's no way that an incumbent president even of Myanmar or of Syria, if they visited Australia, could be tried under our domestic criminal law that implements these international crimes and gives Australian courts universal jurisdiction because as incumbent heads of foreign states, they are immune in the domestic courts of other countries. And all of a sudden the ICC is issuing an arrest warrant for an incumbent president of a country that's chosen not to become a state party. All of a sudden I had to accept that there was some substance to the US objection that I might have missed, perhaps conveniently, in my evangelical fervour to spread the good news of the International Criminal Court back in the late 1990s and early 2000s. It seems to me that this particular institution 
is confronted with some irreconcilable expectations. And I want to identify four separate expectations that, that create problems. First one is that on one hand, the court's expected to be ideal. That is, expected to be committed to ending impunity for atrocity and for international crime. It's expected to be normative, to set normative legal standards of what is acceptable and what is not. It's expected to be principled. It's expected to be transcendental over state sovereignty. And it's expected to be consistent in its decision making. But at the same time that the court's expected to be ideal, it's also expected to be real. It's expected to engage with the Assembly of States parties and to curry their favour and to ensure that its budget is guaranteed from year to year. It's supposed to be grounded. It's supposed to be effective. It's supposed to actually do what it was set up to do. So the idealism and the real realism creates potentially an irreconcilable expectation. A second one is that this court represents a vertical regime on a horizontal plane. And by that I mean in terms of the vertical axis, this is a court set up with legal coercion. This is a court set up to conduct criminal trials and those who are convicted will be sentenced to terms of imprisonment. But that, league, that, that sort of vertical axis comes into, into huge challenge in relation to the horizontal plane on which sovereign states are used to, to playing or to operating or to acting, interacting with each other. These are actors that are used to a consensual approach to the adoption of international legal obligations. And all of a sudden, you have a court that's coming in, cutting right across that approach. A third irreconcilable expectation is that the court's expected to be independent, while at the same time it is thoroughly dependent on states, on international organisations, especially when it comes to gaining physical custody of accused and handing them over. The court does not have police powers of its own, and I'm not advocating that it should, but this creates a big tension. And the fourth irreconcilable expectation if the court's expected to be effective, but it's also expected to grow its legitimacy. And uh, I'll explain a little bit about how that tension works in practice. I'd like to explain for a few minutes how the ICC jurisdiction works, how the process happens, and then a little bit about the current caseload of the court. And then I want to come back to some of these challenges that the court faces as it tries to do its work. In the Rome Statute, Article 13, there are three alternative triggering mechanisms, three alternative ways in which proceedings can be initiated before the court. They are, in chronological order, state party referral. So a, a country which is a party to the Rome Statute can refer to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court allegations that Rome statute crimes are being perpetrated, either in its own country or elsewhere in the world. And when that happens, the prosecutor is authorised to open a formal criminal investigation to determine whether charges should be laid and if so, against whom. And there are four country situations that involve self-referrals currently before the court. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, Central African Republic and Mali. Governments in each of those four countries, all states parties to the Rome Statute, all have gone to the prosecutor at different stages and said, please help us with the justice challenges we face from the civil war that's either just ended or is still ongoing in our country. The second triggering mechanism is UN Security Council referral. So the Security Council members get together and adopt the resolution and by that resolution, refer a country situation or a regional situation within a country to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. And again, when that happens, the prosecutor is then authorised to open a formal criminal investigation. That's happened twice uh, in relation to the Darfur region of, of Sudan, and also uh, that was back in 2005, and more recently Libya in 2011. Both, both situations the states involved are not states parties to the court and the, and, the pro and the UN Security Council has nevertheless referred them to the prosecutor and arrest warrants have been issued. The third triggering mechanism 
It's an interesting one. It, the statute gives to the prosecutor some authority of her own, where on the basis of material that she's been able to gather from the public domain, so not by criminal investigation, but by what's called a preliminary examination of publicly accessible material, the prosecutor goes to a pre-trial chamber of three judges and convinces a majority of them, so at least two of them, that there are reasonable grounds for believing that Rome statute offences have been perpetrated, asking for authority to open a formal criminal investigation. So there's this extra step built into this process to guard against the prosecutor acting on some political or other whim. And in, on three occasions that's happened. The prosecutor's secured approval for the opening of formal criminal investigations. Those country situations are Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast down on the west coast of Africa, and Georgia. Uh, that's not Atlanta, Georgia, that's <laughs> independent country of Georgia, invaded by Russia, at least in respect of its two northern provinces, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Kid you not, this is not uh, Harry Potter stuff. Abkhazia is a real province of Georgia. You learn a lot about geography in this uh, process. We, we, we learnt from the Mali case, first Mali case, that Timbuktu exists. <laughs> yeah, I know you might laugh, but as a young boy growing up in the northwest coast of Tassie in the 1960s, I wasn't sure of that. I was just told from here to Timbuktu it was like a mythical place. <laughs> we learnt from the proceedings against Al Mahdi that it's real and uh, some beautiful things there were, were destroyed. Okay, so in addition to any one, these are all alternatives, these three alternative triggering mechanisms, but one of them has to be triggered. In addition to any one of those three, there are two admissibility criteria that must be satisfied. The first of those is the requirement of consent. Article 12 of the Rome Statute talks about the consent of either the territorial state, the state on whose physical territory the alleged crime occurred, or the state of nationality, the state whose national allegedly perpetrated the offence. Either of those two states must consent to the court exercising its jurisdiction or the court does not have jurisdiction. There are several things to say about this. First of all, this requirement does not apply to triggering mechanism two. So there is no obligation for the UN Security Council to secure the consent of the relevant state. Second thing, I'll come back to that requirement. The second thing that should be noted is that, of course, in some situations of civil war, the territorial state and the sta state of nationality are in fact one and the same. They might not be two separate states. So in those circumstances, only one state can consent. And for triggering mechanism one and three, that state must give its consent. Now back to this exception to triggering mechanism two for the UN Security Council. There's no requirement of consent, and there is not, because at the diplomatic conference in Rome, it was, it was understood and accepted by all the delegations there that the UN Security Council <coughs> cannot be obliged to have the consent of a state, because under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, the constitutional provisions giving authority to the Security Council, the Council members can go so far as to authorise lethal military force against a member state of the United Nations without, obviously without that state's consent, if that's what the members of the Security Council believe is necessary to achieve or maintain or restore international peace and security. So if the Security Council can go that far, it can surely refer a situation to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court and because of the authority that Security Council has in the UN Charter, there is no requirement of consent. So that's the reason why both Darfur and Libya come under the court's jurisdiction because the Security Council has referred them even though neither country is a state party. One final observation to make about this consent requirement is that there are in fact two ways that either the territorial state or the state of nationality can give their consent. If either of them is a state party to the Rome Statute, they are already deemed to have consented to the court's jurisdiction. There's no further requirement. If neither is a state party, then either of them can give their consent ad hoc by way of declaration. Article 12, 12 paragraph 3 of the statute refers to this mechanism. 
and in fact that's happened in a couple of uh, a couple of situations um, Ukraine for example who is not a state party to the Rome statute has nevertheless accepted the court's jurisdiction from the date when Russian forces invaded Crimea uh, that's one example should also point out the second of these two additional admissibility criteria. So one of the three triggers, consent for triggering mechanism one or two. The third, uh, or the second additional admissibility criterion is the so-called complementarity requirement. This is Article 17 of the Rome Statute. And here, both the territorial state and the state of nationality have a better claim on jurisdiction than the International Criminal Court. The court, under this requirement, the court must be satisfied that both states, if in fact they are one, if they are two separate states, one and the same, of course, only one state, is unwilling or unable genuinely to deal with the case themselves. And this requirement applies to all three triggering mechanisms, including UN Security Council referral. So sometimes that's a very easy thing for the court to decide when four states parties come to the court and request the court's assistance it's not difficult to say well they're either unwilling or they're unable it doesn't really matter which but it's it's fine that requirement is satisfied in other circumstances it's more complicated so libya for example insists on trying al sanusi the former head of the um, muammar Gaddafi secret um, secret military police themselves they also want to try safe Gaddafi, the son of the dictator and that requires has required the court to evaluate whether Libya is, well, they're clearly willing, genuinely able to conduct the trial themselves. And that can be quite a sensitive thing, of course, when the International Criminal Court starts to sit in judgment on an, the ability of a sovereign state to fulfil its own domestic criminal law procedures. That's, that's the sort of structure of how it all works. Let me just identify some key concerns from the US that arise out of this as one of the major opponents of the court. From my perspective, I don't think the US is concerned about the circumstances where a member of the US military, unauthorised, clearly violates international criminal law, perpetrates a war crime or a crime against humanity or even an act of genocide. So the, the best example I think I could point to would be Sergeant Bales who walked out of his, um, his US military compound without authorization, fully armed, went into the nearest village and executed 17 unarmed Afghani civilians. And Sergeant Bales was rightly charged and prosecuted by a military court martial under the US's military justice legislation, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, equivalent of Australia's Defence Force Discipline Act. He was charged with 17 counts of murder. He was convicted of all of them, and he sentenced to 17 terms of life imprisonment without parole. The system works fine for situations that are unequivocally serious violations of the Rome Statute. The US is concerned about different scenarios than that one, in my view, two of them in particular. One of them is that what if the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court believes that the US is unwilling to go further up the military chain of command. So, so let's take Abu Ghraib as a hypothetical example. It's hypothetical because Iraq, neither Iraq nor the US were states parties to the Rome Statute when the shocking uh, abuses of, uh, against detainees in that prison were, were, were happening. But if hypothetically the ICC had been had had jurisdiction because Iraq was a state party, let's say. The US's concern will be, well, in the investigation by a US military court-martial, went up certain, certain levels of seniority. So the most senior person tried by court-martial was a senior sergeant, the brigadier, Brigadier Karpinski, one-star general, who was responsible for the detainee management unit, was demoted to full colonel and given a desk job, and that's the end of her military career, but she was not subjected to criminal proceedings. And what if the, and that was it, as far as I understand, in terms of levels of seniority, what if the ICC prosecutor thought, well, hang on a minute, Lieutenant General Sanchez, the three-star general, deployed from Guantanamo Bay to Iraq with a, a mandate to bring more serious, more robust detainee interrogation techniques, we should be looking at him 
to see whether he's responsible criminally. Or what if the ICC prosecutor says, no, 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 I'm not stopping at Lieutenant General Sanchez. I want to I want to investigate Donald Rumsfeld as US Secretary of Defence. He signed the torture memos. What's wrong with these people? I stand for eight hours a day. Those sorts of stuff. What if the prosecutor decides that? That's not that's not palatable in the United States of America. That an international criminal court may actually believe that an investigation against a senior member of an administration would be something that the court ought to engage in. And you can see, in terms of the way the structure of the jurisdiction works, if Iraq had been a state party, it would have already given its consent to the court's jurisdiction over everything that happens on its physical territory, even though the US has chosen not to become a state party. It's a hypothetical example. Let's remember that. But it's, 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 a, it's a, certainly a scenario that causes grave uh, anxiety in Washington probably not only in Washington. The second scenario is what if the ICC prosecutor believes that war crimes have been perpetrated, but the ICC believes they have not? A classic example here would be an aerial bombing campaign. The US undertakes it on the physical territory of the state party to the Rome Statute, and Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, do a big report on selected targeting incidents where a lot of civilians were killed. And the allegations are that um, these constituted the war crime of disproportionate military force. The US believes, may believe, let's say hypothetically believes, that the pilots involved in those targeting decisions and strikes were following their rules of engagement and completely complying with the US's international legal obligations. And the prosecutor takes a different view of interpretation of the statute. In those circumstances, what if she brings charges against US service members? Neither of those scenarios are palatable to the US, and I think it's fair to accept that both are possible, however unlikely, both are possible in terms of the way the jurisdictional competence of the court works. So given that overview of how the sort of how the jurisdictional competence of the court works, let me come back to the irreconcilable expectations. Let's think about the three alternative triggering mechanisms in turn and the criticisms against the prosecutor when she acts and when she doesn't act. Here I'm drawing uh, unashamedly on a fantastic piece of work by a Canadian colleague of mine, Daryl Robinson, who's written a wonderful article in the Leiden Journal of International Law called Inescapable Dyads, Why the ICC Cannot Win. And I, I see some of my students nodding. You should come up and give this part of the presentation because <laughs> they know this uh, article very well. Okay, so I just I don't want to plagiarise Daryl's thoughts. I want to acknowledge that he uh, he's, he's written some really wonderful work on this. Even before we get to the three triggering me mechanisms, let's think about those situations where the ICC has no jurisdiction. The the expulsion of the forced expulsion of the Rohingya from Rakhine State in Myanmar into neighbouring Bangladesh is a very good example. Just a few weeks ago, James Bennett, uh, the ABC correspondent for South Asia, interviewed me about the crimes that were being perpetrated. And he said, when's the ICC going to investigate and start prosecuting people? I said, it's not going to happen, James, at least not now. Well, that's, what, what are you talking about? I mean, I've just been to Bangladesh and it's appalling. He'd been to visit some hospitals and he'd seen people, Rohingya, with limbs lost because of the antipersonal landmines that the, that the Burmese military laid to ensure that as people fled, many of them would be killed that way. He also saw bullet wounds in the back of thighs or, uh, or torsos where the entry wound was what you'd expect, but the exit wound was massive which can only mean the use of explosive rounds or something other than a full metal jacket, a round that is designed to spread in, inside the human body so that survival is a very difficult thing. I mean, these are shocking, shocking things. How can they not be prosecuted? Yeah, mate, well, I could give you ICC 101, like I've just done for you, but uh, he's a journalist, he wasn't interested in that. I had to cut to the chase a little bit more quickly 
But I tried to explain to him that because Myanmar is not a state party to the Rome Statute, the only way the ICC could have jurisdiction is if the UN Security Council referred the situation and then the court could, the prosecutor would be free to investigate. Well, why doesn't that happen? I mean, that should happen tomorrow. It should have happened yesterday. Yeah, mate, it should. But uh, certain permanent members of the Security Council will veto any such initiative. On the day, another example, exactly the same thing, on the day that the prosecutor of the ICC announced that she was opening a preliminary examination of the situation in Palestine, the Israeli Minister of Defence, Avigdor Lieberman, went right off on a media sort of interview. What does she think she's doing when just over the border nearly half a million people have been slaughtered in the Syrian crisis and she's not even investigating that? That's pathetic. Yes, uh, it's pathetic but not pathos directed at the prosecutor because she doesn't have, the court doesn't have jurisdiction. And twice the French have tried to refer by Security Council resolution the crisis in Syria and both times Russia and China have vetoed that resolution. Russians are operating there. They would be subjected to the court's jurisdiction. They don't want that. So yes, it's pathetic, but it's not pathetic because of the ICC. That's where Avigdor Lieberman was incorrect. So this is just a matter of re-education as well as collective frustration. But... Uh, but this isn't really the challenge for the ICC because it's readily explained. What about in the circumstances where the ICC does have jurisdiction? And here, and go back to the three triggering mechanisms, and let me just articulate some of the arguments for and against in, case, in both cases. The same Daryl Robinson, who I've mentioned, the author, is this wonderful resort to, the, uh, to Goldilocks and the Three Bears. She says, what we, of course, are always looking for is the porridge that's just right. But the problem is that you never get to it because it's always either too hot or too cold. Mm -hmm. Nothing is just right. So take, for example, state party referral, the first triggering mechanism. So those who'd argue, yes, you should take on those referrals. So Uganda, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Mali, um, the Central African Republic, they come to the court, the prosecutor says, well, of course, I have to help them out. The criticism is, no, 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 you're just pandering to state interests. This is a lack of independence by the prosecutor. You're sucking up to the governments who've self-referred. But if she didn't take on those cases, the criticism would then be, how can the ICC possibly refuse to take on the situ situations where the countries involved have asked for assistance? So when Uganda tried to self-refer what they attempted to do, the government in, um, in Kampala, was to refer the Lord's Resistance Army. And the prosecutor said, no, 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 that's not the way it works. You refer the situation in the north of Uganda, and I reserve to myself the right to investigate anybody that I think should be investigated. OK, that sounds very good in principle. We, we applaud a, a, an announcement like that. But in the case of each of those four self-referrals, from Kinshasa, Kampala, Bangui and Bamako, if you don't know which is which, go and work it out. It's all good geography. <laughs> Get yourself ready for the next question in the good weekend. Quiz on Saturday. In the case of each of those four self-referrals, there hasn't yet been a single arrest warrant issued against any government official. All the arrest warrants, and there have been arrest warrants in every single one of those four situations, have been issued against members of non-state armed groups. Okay, so, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that the prosecutor only has evidence of crimes being perpetrated by members of non-state armed groups? Well, possibly, but alternative interpretations are also possible, and of course have been levelled at the court critically. So either this is a pragmatic approach because we want to keep the governments on side so they'll cooperate with us as we in undertake our investigations or it's a thoroughly politicised process. There's some sort of deal being done and uh, I'm not suggesting that any of these is correct. I'm just trying to point out the nature of the criticisms. We go to the, so maybe that porridge is too hot, go to the UN Security Council referral mechanism. So if states which are parties and self-refer situations that's all too close 
to state cooperation with the court. The UN Security Council, of course, is at arm's length, and that's going to be much better, independent of self-serving interests. Oh, really? No, 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 you take on the UN Security Council referrals, all you're doing is the bidding of the five permanent members. This is a north-south versus issue. The UN Security Council will never refer Guantanamo Bay, Chechnya, Tibet, or even Syria or Myanmar, both of which should be referred, where one or more of the five permanent members has a vested national interest. But on the other side, the criticism is, well, the fact that Rome statute crimes are going on elsewhere doesn't preclude the rightness of investigating and prosecuting those that the court does have jurisdiction over. Okay, but again, Here's another criticism or source of criticism. In the case of both Darfur and Libya, the two situations referred to by the UN Security Council of the Court, despite arrest warrants being issued against multiple individuals accused in both situations, the court is yet to gain physical custody of a single one of those accused. The sole exception was a group of rebels fighting in the Darfur region who were the subject of preliminary trial proceedings and who rocked up to The Hague unannounced and just uh, turned up. Yeah, I know. I mean, we laughed. We, I don't think they were laughing. And the officer, the prosecutor, and the guy on the front desk, there's a group of guys here from, claim to be from, from Darfur, and, and uh, apparently you want to have a chat to them. So they were never arrested and detained because they kept turning up every time the proceedings were held until the date was set for the trial and all of a sudden never saw him again. <laughs> But apart from those guys, all the others, the subject of arrest warrants, not a single one of them is in custody. And here the criticism is the UN Security Council's unwilling to take substantive action. Gaddafi Muama, that is, the father, is dead. Darfur has settled down. The ICC's then subject to criticism of being a fig leaf for UN Security Council indifference because the court has neither international nor local support. So it appears weak and ineffectual. And in the absence of any support from the UN Security Council, the court's left with giving a hard time to those states' parties that welcome Omar al-Bashir instead of arresting him and handing him over to The Hague in South Africa is the most recent high-profile example of that. This time, in both cases, when the UN Security Council referred the situations, they included a clause in both resolutions excluding the jurisdiction of the court to, non -national, sorry, to nationals of non-state parties. So the P5 were all prepared to hand over to the court authority over Darfur and over Libya, but not over Americans or French or, or Russians or Chinese or British. Why didn't the prosecutor in those circumstances say, that's not how it works, fellas, like he did with Uganda? Why didn't he say, no, nah, I can't take those referrals because you either give me authority over the whole situation or you don't give me authority or, you, or I, I ignore your authority that you're giving me. I didn't think about that at the time. I was quite happy about those referrals when they happened, but uh, these, these criticisms emerge. Okay, so these porridges, they're too hot, they're too cold. Maybe this third mechanism, the prosecutor acting on her own initiative, maybe that's the, it's just perfect and you can scoff it in no time because that's a little bit bold. No, no, no. Here, the ICC is not prepared to stand up to states. It's timid. It's just pandering to state interests on one side of the equation. But the ICC is intervening without invitation, without support, without any prospect of success. It's going to be ineffective. It's going to lose its credibility. The ICC is ignoring legitimate state interests. Why would the prosecutor open on the basis of her own initiative or go to the pretrial chamber and get approval to open a formal criminal investigation in Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire and Georgia, but not also in Afghanistan or Palestine, both the subject of preliminary examinations, for example. This is inconsistent. This is a politicisation of the role of the court. I'm not actually arguing any of these positions. Just please don't misunderstand me. Just trying to articulate them and identify them. So the criticism on one hand will be the court is too deferential to states and on the other it's not deferential enough. It's too reflective of powerful states' agendas. It's too disruptive 
of powerful states' agendas. Well, it's not looking very good, is it? What about in the case of future exercise of the ICC's jurisdiction? Those four self-referrals that I mentioned all involve at least the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the arrest warrants have been issued, all involve uh, members of non-international um, groups. But they're all nationals of the state's parties. What about um, the future situations that the court's looking at? What about UN Security Council referrals that may occur in the future where there's still no guarantee of UN Security Council support? What about the proprio, where the, the, the investigations that have been opened on the basis of the prosecutor acting on her own initiative in Kenya, where Kenyatta and Ruto have been not only able to thumb their nose at the court, but actually buy off witnesses so the case against them both collapse? What about Cote d'Ivoire that's been prepared to surrender physical custody of Laurent Bagbo, the former president, but not of his wife, Simone, who they wanted to prosecute for embezzlement charges back home. And in Georgia, well, Georgia, the first non-African situation to come before the court, what of Russian forces over which the court has jurisdiction? And how will Russia respond to that? Well, we know that not very happily and uh, very ready to exercise the veto power in any other situation where Russian forces are deployed. And even despite those challenges, the Office of the Prosecutor is yet to really test or to experience the increasing controversies around state policy that the court wants to take on. So that hasn't happened so far. The court's been looking at war crimes and crimes against humanity, but what about state policy? What about in Afghanistan? If the prosecutor goes and seeks and gains approval to open a formal criminal investigation, she's already said in her report on her preliminary examination in Afghanistan that one of the practices she's looking at are the CIA prisons that were, hit, that were, that were there and that were also located outside of Afghanistan where Afghani detainees were taken by US forces or by CIA operatives um, in Lithuania, in Poland and the other country escapes me. Uh, what about... How's the US going to react if the prosecutor really takes on policy of government like that? Or in Palestine, the question of Israeli settlements in the West Bank. And that's all before the crime of aggression becomes part of the subject matter jurisdiction of the court, which is supposed to happen in December this year. And then the prosecutor is going to have authority to look at illegal uses of force. Well, what to make of all of this? And uh, guys down the front looking at their watches say, I'm, I'm going to assure them I'm going to wind up. <laughs> How does it help to identify and, uh, and attempt to explain that everything is so contested? And Daryl Robinson is no opponent of the ICC. He's a big fan. His, his, his justification for the article that he's written is the hope to try to deepen the debate around the work and efficacy of the court, to go beyond... Um, shallow criticism and to, to accept the fact that every decision that's made is contested and some of the contestation, at least, is credible and plausible. Do I think all of that represents an existential threat for the ICC? I hope not. <laughs> but, you know, we have seen international organisations ahead of their time in the past. League of Nations didn't last very long. And maybe this ICC, which I suspect could never happen in the 21st century, not in this year. If we were trying to set aside a five-week diplomatic conference in Rome to negotiate a Rome statute for an ICC, there is no way it would happen. 1998, the time was right, but is the institution ahead of its time? That in itself is a contested statement. The fact that the future of the court, in fact, is not in its own hands. It's in the hands of its state's parties and the international community. But some people would say, well, the ICC should just stick to what it was set up to do. But the counter argument would be the ICC would do, should do what it was set up to do. And both of those would disagree with each other position, people who hold those positions. So really, I think it's for states parties uh, and also for the Security Council to decide how much support will they provide to the court? What level of resolve will they draw on to assist the court in taking into custody those accused who are still at large. 
How will it determine the quality of the individuals that are nominated and elected as judges or prosecutors to be involved in an institution where so much is at stake? I think about my colleagues at the Office of the Prosecutor. Their responsibility in the face of all of this bleakness is to really crack on and do as professional a job as they possibly can. But they need to do that knowing that every decision that's taken will be criticised, and much of that criticism, as I said, will be both credible and plausible, because the bowl of perfect porridge doesn't exist. There is no perfect decision. Court staff cannot and do not determine the future of the institution all they can do is fulfil their own responsibility to act professionally and responsibly to make what they consider to be the best decision whenever they're confronted with a decision to make, even if that might only be the least worst decision in the eyes of many and definitely the worst decision in the eyes of many others. I'm not, a, I'm not, a, uh, I'm not trying to advocate for the ICC trying to do too much. And I'm committed to doing everything I can to support the current prosecutor in the challenging role that she has. I want her to understand that she'll never please everybody, possibly sometimes never please anyone at all. And our job is to make the decisions that we think are in the best interests of the institution on the basis of the principles that the office upholds. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. That was uh, absolutely brilliant. I feel I've done a whole couple of years course in one hour, but it has been um, very, very uh, instructive. So uh, the promise to stay for a couple of questions is that there's drinks afterwards. That's the reward. Are there any uh, questions? Yeah. Um, Mike coming. Hi there. Thank you very much for a fascinating um, lecture. I just wanted to ask whether you might be able to make some comment about the ICC's preliminary examination to Palestine, mm -hmm. um, and maybe perhaps make some comment about whether, in fact, um, an intervention um, into the region by the court would be, in fact, feasible, given complementarity and all the procedural obstacles. Yeah. And, in fact, whether it were feasible, whether it's actually desirable given ongoing conflict uh, in this case in Israel-Palestine. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, I should have started off by a disclaimer that I'm not here in my official ICC capacity as Special Advisor on War Crimes. To do that, I would have required approval, and that might not have been given. So, uh, <laughs> so everything that I've said is in my personal capacity. Uh, of course, I'm drawing on experience and observations there. In answering a question like that in relation to a preliminary examination, of course I have to be very careful about what I say publicly, and so I will. I'll talk about what's on the public record. The, the questions about opinions, are, uh, you know, is it desirable, is it plausible, both very valid questions to ask. The first thing I'd say is that in her report to the Assembly of States parties last year, there'll be another report updating where things are at this year, which I imagine will be made public in the lead up to the Assembly of States parties in December. But the prosecutor explained what, she, what had happened already in terms of the Palestine situation. So I'm, not, I'm, I'm sharing what's in the public domain. She talked about uh, preliminary examination into the uh, last Israeli Defence Force incursion into Gaza in 2014. She talked about um, various uh, practices and incidents, she didn't really name incidents in great detail, but she talked about uh, policies or, or uh, practices of, adopted by both Hamas as well as the Israeli Defence Force, so Hamas. Uh, she talked about indiscriminate rocket attacks into Israel. And in the case of the IDF, she mentioned um, in explicitly the, the whole um, Hannibal directive and overwhelming firepower to ensure that a member of the Israeli Defence Force is not abducted successfully by Hamas. If that means killing hundreds of people, OK, that's what we'll do. So that, that's sort of mentioned explicitly. And then she also talks about um, 
Israeli settlements in the West Bank, transfer of Israeli uh, citizens into the West Bank and forced uh, expulsion of some Palestinians out of the West Bank. So to answer your questions about um, this, is it plausible for the ICC to countenance the next step, which would be Presumably, uh, unless Palestine or some other state party refers the situation and gives the prosecutor authority to open a formal criminal investigation, the prosecutor would have to go to the pretrial chamber and ask for approval for that. She has to make a call on that at some stage in the future. And I'm sure part of the decision making has to be the plausibility of any cooperation from uh, Palestinian Authority, Israel and Hamas. Uh, and she must also make a call on complementarity and look at the extent to which Israel has investigated allegations of war crimes in Gaza in particular to decide whether or not Israel is willing and genuinely able to conduct bona fide investigations in relation to those incidents or not. The settlements uh, in the West Bank, of course, are more... Uh, I think easier in terms of the complementarity question because it's part of government policy, so it's not a difficult thing for the court to make a decision on that. But I'm not trying to suggest that that means they're going to go for that. There are a whole lot of other factors that have to be taken into account. The desirability factor, of course, is one of them. And prosecutor has to decide whether she believes, having been satisfied of all the jurisdictional requirements, in the interests of justice, she ought not proceed to open a formal criminal investigation. And she can do that on the basis of, uh, if she takes this view, on the basis that there's a process that's supposed to be ongoing in terms of peaceful negotiations between the parties. I'm not suggesting that that's what she will decide because a lot of, not a lot of progress has been made on that in the last few years, but those are the sort of factors that are gonna to have to be taken into account. And of course, as you know better than uh, better than me, perhaps the sensitivities around that are massive. And I'm I'm uh, always surprised every time I go to Israel and have conversations about other matters, including World Vision matters. There's uh, the conversations almost invariably turn to the ICC, and I say I can't say anything. You know that, but yeah, we'd like to find out. And there's a lot of thought and uh, awareness of the existence of the court and its potential jurisdiction because Palestine has been accepted as a state party. My students here role played this question, Jeremy, we could get them up and they could give you very plausible arguments on desirability, yes and no, I'm sure. Is there another question? Yes. I have a question which I hope will be simple, which is, does the um, court yes. have a statute of limitations? Is there a, um, a certain period at which they can or can't go back? Yeah, great, thanks. I didn't talk about temporal limitations. First thing to, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of answer a little bit more than just the specifics of the question. I'll come to the statute of limitations issue, but first question, a uh, first issue to note is that the Rome Statute gives to the court no retrospective jurisdiction. So the first date on which the court can consider anything is the 1st of July 2002, and that depends on when the state in question gave its consent to be bound, whether it became a state party on the first day or subsequently. So Afghanistan, for example, became a state party to, Rome, to the Rome Statute in 2003. And the court has jurisdiction over everything that happened on the physical territory of Afghanistan from that date. In terms of the end date, in 1946, in the first session of the UN General Assembly, just been set up that year, the UN Charter was uh, negotiated in, uh, in Washington, D.C. The, the year before, opened for signature on the 24th of October, that's UN Day, uh, and entered into force, and the UN sort of convened for the first time in 1946. One of the first resolutions of the UN General Assembly was the affirmation of the Nuremberg Principles, the resolution was called, and it um, revisited the subject matter jurisdiction of the Nuremberg Tribunal, the International, International Military Tribunal conducted in Nuremberg, which had commenced in 45 and, and passed judgment in 46, 1946. Um, and in that resolution, 
Amongst other things, the three categories of crimes prosecuted at Nuremberg and also at Tokyo because Tokyo's charter was modelled on the Nuremberg Charter, crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity. They were all reaffirmed as part of the corpus of international criminal law and that no statute of limitations applied to them. And that has been the position of international law since then. It doesn't matter how long an arrest warrant as, as how long ago an arrest warrant was issued, it's valid until the individual in question dies. The ICC has no jurisdiction in absentia, so once someone dies, it's, there's, there can't be more proceedings. But So the arrest warrant against Omar al-Bashir, the incumbent president of Sudan, for example, looks well entrenched in power, it was issued against him in 2006 or 2007. That's valid for the rest of his life. And uh, he has to be a little bit careful about where he travels. You can't go to Switzerland for medical treatment. You might not go back to South Africa. South either. Africa uh, <laughs> didn't hold him. Um, because we're a little over time, I'm going to, on your behalf, uh, thank... No, not at all. It was stimulating. Thank uh, Tim. Um, often, dare I say it, in uh, law school there were very dry lecturers. <laughs> Um, tonight uh, we've had a brilliant legal mind and passion and conviction and values and heart and um, with the, all the idealism that I think we all share for the ICC to succeed. Also realism about uh, our world, the UN Security Council and what all that means. On your behalf, let me thank you, Tim, for a brilliant lecture. Thanks very much.